Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to talk a little bit about the rescheduled DJI event and talk a whole lot about why I think DJI is clearly positioned to dominate the drone market for at least the next six months based on some groundbreaking technology I fully expect they're going to announce at this event in New York City in a few weeks. Now before I get too deep into this, don't hate on me. If you're a fan of other technologies, yes I love DJI, I talk about them a lot, but I fly everybody's quad, so this isn't a DJI guy talking about DJI tech and everybody else's stuff stinks. I fly the Autel, the Unique, the Parrot, a bunch of third-party drones that aren't big in the industry, and I'm comparing what I think is coming to the market space that's out there today, and that's why I'm saying I think DJI from an engineering perspective, has really built the quad that's going to own that market in a couple of different price points for at least the next six months based on the competition that's out there today. Having said all that, this clip is based on pure speculation on my part. I have no inside information on what's going to be released other than my assessment of the leaks that have taken place over the last couple of weeks. We've seen pictures, some of them good, some of them grainy, of what we can expect. We've seen tweets come out from people that are supposedly inside of DJI telling us things we're not supposed to know. And then the Argos catalog got leaked by our friends over at Droning On, and that was the first real indication I had that the Mavic 2 was a real product. Now you can argue maybe that was fake, maybe it wasn't. I think it's real, and I think that product is coming, and I think those pictures were legitimate. So what I'd like to do with this clip I don't want to regurgitate all the specs that are out there. There's a hundred clips that are doing that already. What I really want to do with this clip is take a flyer's perspective and look at the features that we think we know are coming in this Mavic 2 and then think to myself, are those features that are worth the purchase price for me as a flyer? Because I don't like chasing cool technology. I'm not a big fan of buying cool stuff. I'm a fan of buying things that really give me a good value for my money. And for me to spend the money on a Mavic 2 over the Mavic Pro that I already own, it really has to have some compelling features built into it. So I'll talk about each of the four or five features we know that are coming on the new Mavic 2, and I'll spend some time explaining why the engineering behind that really makes a difference for me as a flyer. I'm going to divide the clip into two parts. The first part, I'm going to focus on what we know. Now, we don't really know anything, but we kind of know stuff. So that's the what we know section. The second part of the clip is going to be on what we don't know. Because I've studied DJI for a lot of years, and if you've watched the channel for any length of time, you know I love tearing these things apart, really getting down to the circuit boards and understanding the engineering and the design philosophy behind the stuff they're building, and why they made those choices from an engineering perspective, and at every step. These guys have amazed me. They've really not taken a shortcut in anything I've seen, both in the hardware and the software. They've really thought through the technology and built a product that just delights the consumer. And I know people are going to complain, oh, their service isn't that great, we have a hard time getting stuff fixed. Every company that builds complex products like this has issues. I mean, I had a, I had a washing machine go bad at home from a large manufacturer. It took me months to get the thing fixed because parts weren't available, this guy wasn't available, the parts weren't ordered correctly. So every piece of technology has got issues, and I'm not defending them. I wish they were better but it is what it is. I'm focusing on the technology today. So I've got to say out of the gate, when that Mavic Pro hit a year and a half ago, two years ago, it was an epiphany from a technology perspective. Quads up to that point were pretty much a fixed airframe that were really advanced and had some special features in them, but they were big and they were hard to transport. And I spent a lot of time on the road. I travel a lot. I was flying all the Phantom products, the Inspire product, and they were wonderful quads, but they were big. When that Mavic Pro hit, it was the first what I'll call prosumer drone that folded up and that was ultimately portable and it really changed the game for me. It was, from a technological perspective, an epiphany like the microwave oven, the VCR, the, uh, the GPS coordinator, smartphones, all those things were disruptors in the space. This was really a disruptive frame. It was different than anything that came out and I know some people will say, oh wait a minute, GoPro had a foldable. The GoPro wasn't this. The GoPro was bigger, it was clunkier, and ultimately didn't play out. Even though I love that company and I was a fan of that product, and still hope they bring a drone out because I love the competition, um, that really wasn't a competitor to the Mavic. The Mavic wasn't just a foldable drone. It was a foldable drone with such advanced features that I said at the time, it was designed by aliens. I don't know how they came up with it. That must have been years in the making to put that together. Since then, a ton of companies have come out with foldable drones. We've got the brand new Autel Evo a bit of a clone. We've got the brand new Anafi, not so much a clone, but still a folding drone. We've got a bunch of other lesser known names that have come out with drones. We've got the new product from uh, Unique, the I think it's a Mantis Q that came out in Europe. It's not out in the States yet, but they're all kind of derivative of this original folding drone design. Even though the arms fold differently and all that, they're chasing this market because DJI, when they released this, 
shot across the bow of everybody else out there and own that foldable market for the last year and a half. And I think this Mavic 2 is going to dominate at least for the next six months, maybe even the next two years, based on what I think is coming with it. But this is hands down the favorite drone to fly for me. Even though I fly the Phantoms on occasion, I fly the Inspire 2 now to do professional work. This is the one that I have with me in my backpack more often than any other drone because it's got everything I need in the package. So my conversation again is, why would I ever upgrade? Is this Mavic 2 big enough for me to put this thing on a shelf and go fly the Mavic 2? And I think it is. I also think it's a perfect drone for a lot of people entering the hobby for the first time. So let's get started with the review. So what we know today is there'll be at least two models, maybe three models of the Mavic 2 coming out. There'll be a Mavic 2 Zoom, there'll be a Mavic 2 Pro, and there'll be a Mavic 2 Enterprise. Now I won't talk about the Enterprise right now, I'll talk about that at the end because I think the Enterprise is a really good thing to look at because it's going to include all the high-end features when that product's released that'll eventually trickle down to the consumer version. So it's a good canary in the coal mine, for lack of a better term, to show us where we're heading with this particular hobby. But let's talk about the two we know we're coming. So the Mavic 2 Zoom, we've all talked about it. It's got a zoom lens on it. Pretty advanced feature for a camera to have an optical zoom inside that inside that gimbal assembly, and that really opens up a lot of possibilities for photography. I, I fly the Anafi today, that's got a digital zoom on it. Some of the other uh, Mavic products had a digital zoom as well. It was a little bit clunkier than the Anafi. The Anafi is a little bit smoother, but I love the fact that I can put the drone up and focus on something far away and bring it in closer with that zoom. Now we all know digital is not as good as optical, so having a 2x optical zoom really se separates that drone from the other competitors out there, and that's going to be the least expensive version of the product. So kind of cool they've got coming out with, uh, with the zoom on it. The Mavic 2 Pro is the one that I'm really excited about. That's the one that has a one inch sensor on it. And it's not just a one inch sensor, it's the Hasselblad camera. Hasselblad's a company that DJI got involved with a bunch of years ago, bought a big stake in. I think they actually own the company now. And I've been waiting for some time for DJI and Hasselblad to come out with some cooperative camera and gimbal assembly to put on the quads. This is the first one they're releasing. I expect we'll see others coming soon. But if that's got a one inch sensor on it, that's a compelling event for me because that means I don't have to fly my Phantom products at this point. I've got a one-inch sensor on a foldable drone. The Phantoms go up on the shelf. Now, I know there's a Phantom 5 probably in design, maybe going to be released by Christmas. That's got to have some cool features that, that'll draw me back to the Phantom because it's a bigger package. So having that one-inch sensor on here is a home run for me. I also think it's going to have a variable aperture, which will eliminate some of the ND filters out there. It'll give you better depth of field, f-stop variables. There's a lot of things that that camera can do because, again, Hasselblad, even though they don't make the sensors, they make the cameras. And they're a high-end camera company that really is going to build some innovation into that product. So that one-inch sensor to me is a really Really, really big deal because it allows me to capture those those pro quality pictures from a height with a portable drone that's just going to blow my socks off so that's pretty cool um, well let's talk a little bit about two other features that are kind of tied together actually three features the obstacle avoidance the um, active track 2.0 and the a pass now a lot of people uh, kind of mix these things up because they are different so the the obstacle avoidance is really the drone trying to avoid a wall the A-Pass is the drone finding a hole, trying to find a hole through those obstacles. So they're kind of different sides of the same coin, but the technology behind how they work is dramatically different. So the fact that they've got obstacle avoidance that may have a 360 bubble around it, that's kind of interesting because if you're a new flyer, obstacle avoidance is absolutely essential because you're going to run into a tree or a wall, I guarantee it. All of us have done it. Don't be embarrassed by it. It just happens. It's part of learning how to fly. Having obstacle avoidance means you'll get close to it and it'll, it'll stay away from it. So it's going to save your drone quite a bit. I don't use obstacle avoidance that much, but I love APAS. Now, APAS was first introduced on the Mavic Air, and it's an incredibly sophisticated technology. It isn't just having a couple of sensors on the front of the drone looking for the trees to kind of get around. It's a grouping of sensors, up to seven sensors, that are looking at that environment. They're actually drawing an active 3D map of the environment in front of it with a ton of processing power inside the quad to actually process all that information and draw conclusions about what those things mean up front. And it's a bit like a linebacker trying to find a hole in a football line where it's looking for that clean space to get through. And I, I liken it to sort of cat's whiskers, you know, because cats have whiskers on the front. Those whiskers are incredibly intelligent to let that cat know, can it get through a particular spot and what's going on in front of it. So it's, it's sort of the antenna the cat uses to know there's a mouse over here, there's a couch over there. And that's exactly what that A-Pass is going to do. So for me, having A-Pass built into this product means that I can put it up, I can run through a forest or shuffle through a forest at my age and have it follow me through those trees and not bang into a tree. So I think A-Pass is a feature that I absolutely want on this technology. And it's something I love about that Mavic Air. It really is an incredibly sophisticated technology. Now, when I talk about ActiveTrack, 
they were one of the first companies that actually built in the ability of a drone to zero in on a person and follow that person around. Now, the early versions of that were kind of crude, and they worked okay if you were in an open field, but the minute you turned sideways and weren't the same profile, or if there were a lot of other obstacles around you, um, it would get confused. It could lose you. So if you ducked behind a tree and came back out, it may not pick you up again. So it was kind of interesting to use if you were you know, sort of running along a path and there wasn't a lot of obstacles around. They've since upgraded that through firmware updates, which is something I love about DJI. They come out with constantly improved feature sets through firmware updates. Active Track has gone through a bunch of firmware updates, so they built in profiles for people, for dogs, for boats, for bicycles, for motorcycles, which kind of hones in on what you're doing at that moment, and it has a much more expanded profile to keep track of you. So the latest versions of it, Active Track 2, means that it takes a picture of me or at least understands my profile, and if I turn sideways, it still knows it's me. If I duck behind a tree and come out, it knows it's me. So that follow mode uh, is a really important feature set, especially if you're an active person and you're on a skateboard or you're on a bike or on a boat. Turning that on makes the average flyer an excellent photographer because it allows you to follow at different distances and make changes to the quad's telemetry while it's flying. So I think those three features are all sort of intertwined, but they're different in some respects. But I think that's going to make a big difference for me with that new quad. And I think it's all based on the enhanced cores that they've got in the quad and the intelligence behind it. The software needs to be upgraded as well to handle all those feature sets. And I think they're going to do a great job. So I'm real interested when we get to that launch event, which we'll be at, by the way. We got the invitation. We're going. We've got it scheduled. I'm real interested in seeing how well those work and what the software can do with those feature sets. So that's pretty cool. The last thing I'll talk about is the distance. Now, a lot of people are making a big deal out of this. It used to go, I guess, five kilometers or six kilometers on the Mavic. The new one goes seven kilometers. Now, everybody else kind of went to the, the old standard, which was 4.3 miles. So when the Evo came out, they made a big deal out about the Evo flying 4.3 miles. Well, DJI said, okay, now we go five miles. I don't care that it flies five miles. None of you should care that it flies five miles because you can't fly five miles legally. You can't. You have to maintain in the States visual line of sight on the quad, which means I've got to see it. Now, even if you're a young guy, I don't think you can see five miles out. I'm sure you can't. You probably can't see two miles out. I'd be shocked if you can see a mile out. So why do I care that I can fly five miles with the quad when I have to keep it in visual line of sight? The reason I care is because if I know that telemetry and that connection topology will maintain a strong signal five miles out, it means when I'm in closer and I've got trees or I've got buildings or I've got interference, I've got a much stronger signal, which means I'm not going to lose video feed, telemetry, control of the drone in those really harsh, busy environments. I'm going to maintain control of that drone. So for me, tweaking that a little bit, okay, if you're a race car guy, you want to have that specification that you're a quarter of a second faster than the next guy, so it does fly further on paper. For me, from a practical standpoint, it means I've got a stronger signal in close. And honestly, I don't know how they're doing it because there are limits with the FCC on how much transmitter power you can have how much amplification you can get through dB increases on the antennas. And those two together, there's a formula. So the fact that it's more powerful and it allows me to travel further either means they've improved the topology, the connection topology, or they've done something to the transmitter and the antenna system to flatter that signal a little better. But we'll have to see how that happens when it comes out. These are all things I'm going to investigate. Some of these topics I'm actually going to put separate clips together to dive a little bit deeper into it because I get a ton of questions on the channel from you guys about how Active Track works, how iPass works, and all the rest of that. So I'll spend a little bit of time and put some engineering conversations around that. All right, so that's the stuff we know. Is that enough? For me, it's totally enough. If they just did the one inch sensor, that's enough for me right there. The fact that they've improved the technology around the obstacle avoidance, the A-pass, the active track, that's a home run for me. That, that's stuff that I really want to have in that quad. I think there's other stuff in there that we don't know about at this point. So one of the speculative points that I want to make is I said from the beginning that this kind of improvement that one inch sensor is going to bring to the quad is a big deal for me and that's enough for me to buy it. But if DJI was able to put a removable gimbal on that product, sort of like what the Karma did, that would be unbelievable. And that may be something that's coming. And some of the indications that may be in the mix are some of the photos that have come out around this portable gimbal assembly. We've seen diagrams. I've done research on patents and trademarks. And there's some diagrams out there that show that removable gimbal as part of this new quad. Now, if that turns out to be exactly what they're doing, that would be a home run for us because that would mean I can pull that smaller sensor off, put the bigger sensor on, move that sensor to the portable gimbal, maybe move it to some other technologies, and I'll talk about that in a second. So I wouldn't be surprised if they show us that it is a removable gimbal at the launch, but we'll see. And if it isn't, no big deal. Maybe that's coming on the Phantom 5 product, but I think if I were DJI and I were in the engineering team arguing for features that should have been in the Mavic Pro 2, that removable gimbal would have been one of them. Um, another thing I think we may see at that launch is this 
this terrestrial vehicle, the Rover. Now they've had a, a RoboMasters product out for a couple of years. They filed patents on it, trademark agreements on it. They actually sold them for a while in Europe. They had them in some of their showrooms and I've got a picture up now showing those products. Um, it would be cool to have a terrestrial vehicle that I could move that gimbal assembly to and use it as sort of an RC on the ground. So if I'm doing photography, that would give me the ability to chase somebody with that around or maybe use it in a professional setting. Maybe that's only something we'll see in the Enterprise version. And maybe the removable gimbal won't be in the Enterprise version as well. We'll have to see how that plays out. Um, two other things that I wanted to talk about had to do with the Mavic Enterprise. Now, we've seen photos out there of the Mavic Enterprise with attachments on the bottom and attachments on the top. I think the Mavic Enterprise is going to be a product that's going to be very expensive. I don't think it's going to be consumer priced. It'll probably be in the M series, M600 series pricing. But the fact that they're using the Mavic for an enterprise level product means that they've got plans to release probably thermal combination 4K cameras, um, maybe you know other technologies around. We, people are speculating the thing on the top was a speaker. Why would you use a speaker? Well, you might use that if you're sort of negotiating with hostages or you're out in the forest and you're trying to find somebody and you've got a drone up 200 feet and you can yell the kid's name or the girl's name out to say, hey, we're here, we're here to help you, come get us. So there are a lot of possibilities there, but I love that they're building or thinking about building at least based on those photos, an extensible platform. Something that you can put up in the air and add things to, much like they did with the last go-round of their uh, commercial drones. And they're using the Mavic chassis, which means the engineers that are designing the Mavic, that team, which again is different than the Phantom, different than the Inspire, are thinking about ways to make this extensible, and hopefully that trickles down into the com uh, consumer versions of it that we're all buying when this thing hits the street. So that's kind of my short take on it. I don't want to make this too long a clip, but for me, from an engineering and a consumer perspective, I think this Mavic 2 represents a radically new design of the Mavic, Mavic product, and some of the features they're building in there really make it a compelling decision for me to pick up that quad and fly that quad. So again, we'll be at the event. Um, I'm going to order one of each as soon as they're available. I'll have them in as quickly as I can get them. You can expect me to do a ton of uh, clips comparing them to the current Mavic and all the other quads that are in the market. I'm going to tear them apart. You guys aren't going to like seeing that, but I'm going to rip the covers off and take a look inside and see what they've done to improve the engineering there as well. So stay tuned to the channel if you're interested in any of that. If you have any questions about what I've talked about or you have speculations on your own you want to add, drop them in the comments below. I love going through these sort of mental exercises to figure out what they might be doing next and what that means for me. And at the end of the day, like I said before, I don't care about cool. I mean, it's nice that it's cool, but for me it's about is the value built into that product that I want to spend my hard-earned money on? And that's kind of the approach I'd like to take with all these new releases that are coming out when I do reviews. So thanks an awful lot for watching. I love putting these clips together. So as long as you guys keep watching, I'll keep making them. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button down there and join the Drone Valley family. We'd love to have you on board as a subscriber. But until next time, happy flying.